morning. We are going to stand and open up with Soul on Fire. Lord, I have called you in righteousness. I will take you by the hand and keep you. To bring out the prisoners from the dungeon. Sing to the Lord a new song, his praise to the ends of the earth. Let the farmlands of Gilbert and the inhabitants of Lexington sing for joy. Good and gracious Father, Lord, we gather here today in your house as your people. Father, we come here today to seek your blessing, to have your hand upon us, Lord, to breathe your Holy Spirit into our spirits that we too can be a soul on fire for you. Father, help us burn with that love, with that passion. Help us feel, Lord, your closeness, Lord, the affection that you have for us. Father, I pray that you pour your Holy Spirit upon everybody here. I pray, Lord, that we would know how much you love us. I pray, Lord, that each one of us would feel, at least for a moment, how you see us, Lord, as a precious treasure to be sought, to be adored, to be kept, Lord, and to be treasured. Father, help us know you as that true treasure. Help us to know you, Lord, as what must be sought among anything else, Lord. 
Help us to know you, Lord, Father, is that treasure that we would sell everything else in this world for, even our own lives, that we might have you, Lord. Father, bless this time together, Lord. Bless all of us together, Lord. Bind us together in love. May the words of our mouths and may the meditations of our hearts, Lord, give you praise and glory. And all God's people said, amen. We are going to remain standing and sing hymn number 420, God of grace and God of glory. Please be seated. Well, good morning. It's great to see all of you here in the house of our God and King on this, the day that the Lord has made. Let us truly rejoice and be glad in it. And I'm glad all of you got to be in here before that rain opened up and poured down. And you can really hear it coming down on that metal roof we have, but it's a beautiful, beautiful sound. I'm glad we have the rain. And I'm very glad, especially glad that we have a shelter from the storm. Not only from this one, but from the storms of life, which is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who shelters us in his mercy and in his goodness from every storm that life might throw at us. If you're a visitor here today, I want to welcome you. Glad you're here with us. And uh, everything you need to know to follow along with the service can be printed right here in your bulletin. And if you are joining with, with us live or recorded later in the day or week, then everything you need to know to follow along with the service is going to pop up at the screen at just the right time. Uh, there are a few announcements I would like to bring uh, to your attention. Uh, we have got small groups kicking off in full force this week. Uh, the youth is going to meet tonight at 5 o'clock right here at the church, and that is for all middle and high school youth. We invite you to attend and bring a friend. And also, if you're a youth and you're here right now, if you could stay for a little while after church, we're going to do some practicing uh, for Youth Sunday, which is in just two weeks. So youth, please make plans to, to stay afterwards to practice for that. Uh, women's group is going to continue to meet this week. They meet on Wednesday. And if you're a woman, you get two options to meet. You can do Wednesday at 1230, and that's going to be at Nancy Comer's house. 
and they're going to be studying women of the Bible. Is that got that right? Women of the Bible? Yeah, women of the Bible. No, no, no. no 1230, they're just studying women of the Bible. You're projecting, Harris. You're projecting. No. But, all right, if you want to go to the nighttime group, the nighttime group's a little wilder, okay? Because they're studying bad women of the Bible. And the, the, the nighttime group meets at 7 o'clock here at the church. So if you want to study just regular women of the Bible, 1230, and Nancy Combers, if you want to study bad girls of the Bible, that's 7 o'clock here at the church. <laughs> Both of those are on Wednesday. Harris is leading the bad girls, by the way. I mean. <laughs> Good company. And the men, men are kicking off again now too, okay? Wednesday, 7 o'clock, right here at the church. Uh, Dinner is going to be provided. Um, if you can talk to John about that, if you're not on the remind text, we need to get numbers so we know how many to expect, how many to prepare for. But we're going to be watching The Chosen uh, this cycle around. So that's 7 o'clock here at the church, also on Wednesday night. And finally, our Crafty Draft uh, Theology Discussion Group is, uh, or Theology on Tap Theology Discussion Group is also kicking off Monday. We're going to meet 6.30 at the Crafty Draft Brew Pub. Uh, we invite you to come for always a lively and in-depth, if not always straightforward conversation about theology. Now, don't believe, any, any other announcements? No other announcements, I don't believe. So with none others, I would like to invite the children of the church to come forward. And join Nell here by the baptismal font for a moment for children. Good morning. Good morning. How are y'all this morning? Good. Good week? Okay, I have a question for you. It's a test. Don't you like test? Okay, when you get a gift that's not for a good reason, what's it called? Okay, I'm going to test you again later on. It's a Cersei. Yeah, they're out this right, you about to say that? Yeah, I've heard that before, Scott. That would have been, that right, that would have been close. Okay, what is this? Flashlight. What do we use flashlights for? You see it Right. If you want to go hunting, okay. Or it's, or if you're getting up at night, it's really dark. And it's actually dark. What if you're camping? And, you know, if the sun goes down, you might need a flashlight. What if you've lost something in the house? You need to look under the cabinet or the dresser or whatever. Flashlight's always good. Or if you have electricity out at night. If electricity goes off, there's all kinds of things. And we have these little, we've got other flashlights, but these are amazing. You can just, you know, they're like a dollar. So why don't you just get a bunch of them and have them everywhere, and then you don't have to look for them. It's great. Well, did you know that God wants us to be lights? He wants us to glow like light bulbs. And, but he's talking about a different kind of light. He told in Matthew, neither, neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. And that way you, you need to let your light shine with others. How do we do that? Scott? Be kind to people. Be kind to people, absolutely and not turn off the lights, okay? And that way they see your good deeds and they can praise our Father in heaven. So he wants us to use our words and actions to shine his light. And if you're a good and faithful person, boys and girls, um, they will wonder you know, what makes you that way? And that's how you shine your light. You don't do things for others and then say, oh, guess what I did? You do things for others. People see how kind you are and your light is shining. When you shine the light in the darkness, what happens to the darkness? Asher? Right, the darkness goes away and it shows light so you can see where you're going, absolutely. And 
we don't know how to have joy or goodness some people because they've been in the darkness for so long so that's who we need to help and show our light and make them um, feel much better but um, just always act like a flashlight shine your light do good deeds don't brag about what your deeds have been because that's not what we're supposed to do we're supposed to let people see our good deeds and know that we're doing things because that's what Jesus wants us to. Right? Okay. Would you like to pray us out today? You got a question? No, I don't have a question. Okay. We're going to let her because she wanted to last Sunday and we kind of had to do a thing there. Okay? Thank you, Lord, for giving us our food and, and Jesus for coming out to save us. Amen. Amen. All right, y'all go and have a good week and shine your lights. Friends, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. We deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us and we even make our God out to be a liar. But if we are truthful, then we confess our sins, then God shows himself to be righteous and just and forgives us for all of our iniquities. Friends, let us come and confess our sins together, first in quiet reflection in our hearts and to God alone, and then together as it's printed in the bulletin. Let us pray. And now together. Merciful God, you have given me all. You have given me each day and each minute of my life. It belongs to you and not to me. Yet I act as if it is all mine. I guard my moments and life and keep them for myself. I say in my heart, these are my days to do with as I please. I have forgotten, Lord, that all times are your times, and every day and season was created for your glory. I lift up to you whatever time I have here on earth and give it to you, my God. May each moment of my life be consecrated to you and become a testament to all that you have done in my life. In Christ Jesus, we pray. Amen. Friends, hear the good news. Who is in a position to condemn? Only Christ. And Christ died for us. Christ rose for us. Christ reigns in power for us. Christ prays for us. I declare to you in the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Thanks be to God. We are now going to stand and sing, Come As You Are.
Please be seated. This week we are continuing to look at the epistle of John, the first letter of John. And today we're in uh, chapter 2, verses 1 to 6. And before we read that, let us pause for a moment in prayer. Good and wonderful Father. Lord, we come to you with thanksgiving, Lord, for every gift you have given us and for giving us the path, Lord, that leads to righteousness. Father, we know that this word was incarnated in your Son who came to live among us, to die for the forgiveness of our sins and to raise again, rise again to new life. Lord, as he gives us life, Lord, grant us life to what we read and to what we hear today. Pray, Lord, that you would breathe your Holy Spirit out upon us upon the scripture reading, Lord, that you would open our hearts and minds, that we would hear, that we would read, and that we would understand. Lord, bless this holy reading of your holy word. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. This is 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 to 6. Listen now to the word of the Lord. My little children... I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. 
And by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word in him, truly the love of God is perfected. By this we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. As a kid, I really love scary movies. Well, okay, I still love scary movies. That's something that I've never quite grown out of. And one of the favorite movies to watch was, of course, a good old-fashioned werewolf movie. Now, werewolves are always found are very interesting creatures because they came about when just a normal person is bit by a wolf or bit by a werewolf and then this infection kind of goes through them and every time that there is a full moon they then transform into this awful beast and they go ravaging doing terrible awful things into the community and just being just a, a a pest more than a pest just a terrible evil awful nuisance to their world around them now, I remember seeing one movie where they, they, there's this werewolf out there ravaging this community. And so, of course, these courageous men get together to hunt the werewolf down. And you all remember how you kill a werewolf, right? Yep. Anybody remember? Silver bullet. That's right. Regular bullets don't work on the werewolf. Got to use silver bullets. So the group figures out. They forge themselves a silver bullet. They hunt the werewolf down and they shoot them. Now, this is normally the victorious time. Yay, the monster's dead. But see, the werewolf story's a little different. There's a little tragedy to it. Because I remember watching a movie, and they hunt the werewolf down, they kill him, and as they're looking at the body of the werewolf, he's slowly transforming back into this young teenage boy. They killed the werewolf, but they killed a person too. See, that's what werewolf's a little bit different than your regular monster, right? A werewolf is just a normal person, usually a a fairly decent, good person living in the community. They're an accountant or or a farmer or a businessman or a teacher. It's a father or maybe a young boy who's playing on a football team going to make varsity this year, and then something unfortunate happens to him. He's bit. It's not his fault at all. He has his infection go through him now. And every full moon turns into an awful monster. It's a tragic figure. And we watch this, and we can't help but have a little bit of empathy. There's a strong words there. Can't help but have a little bit of empathy for this person who has turned into a creature because it's really not his fault. And this could be anybody. This could be us. See, I I mentioned last week, you might remember that monsters are a symbol of sin and evil and wickedness and corrupted humanity. And the cure is we not make friends with monsters or, or, or get into romantic relationships with monsters. You're supposed to kill the monster. But the werewolf is different. Because you don't want to kill the monster. You want to cure the monster because you don't want to kill the person. The werewolf is different because it could be any of us. Any of us could be transformed like that. If the mythology is correct, of course. Now what I like about the werewolf analogy, it is a great symbol for the human condition. The werewolf is a wonderful symbol for the human condition because what it means and what it says is we all have a monster inside of us. Every one of us. Every one of us has a monster inside. We call it sin and we call it evil and every single one of us has this monster inside and it can get triggered at any minute. And it's not necessarily our fault. 
It's called original sin. We were born with it. That's what our doctrine teaches. All of us were born with the taint of original sin. All of us were born with this monster inside of us. We didn't choose it. Of course, we incur our own guilt by sinning, but we did not choose this infection originally. Not our fault at all. And you can actually see it in, in, see it in your kids. You can see that, that trace, that taint of original sin in our own children. We, we look at them, and you know, and they're, for a long, they're usually like these wonderful, beautiful babies, and these kids are like, oh, they're so adorable. They're so innocent. They're so sweet. And then something happens. If you've had kids, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Something happens, something gets triggered. Usually they don't get what they want, and they turn into this beast. Ah, this snarling, awful, drooling beast that demands to have its way, maybe throwing a tantrum, and you're like, what happened? What happened to this beautiful, sweet, innocent baby that I brought home from the hospital? Now, I'd like to say, as you get older, you grow out of it. But let's be honest, we don't grow out of it. And most of the time, we're good people. Most of the time, we're perfectly reasonable, rational people. We're great to get along with. We're a lot of fun. And we could just be just really cool, good people most of the time. And then someone flips that switch. It could be a certain temptation that we have a weakness for. It could be an event that triggered us. It could be a person that triggers us. And all of a sudden, we're not that sweet, normal, reasonable person anymore. The beast comes out, and we go into total beast mode, and we say things that we don't mean to say, and we do things we don't mean to do, and then we come back to our normal selves. We have to say, what have I done? Why did I just say that? Or why did I just do that? We all have our full moon moment, don't we? We all have that thing that triggers us to bring the monster out inside. And in that moment, we realize that we really are broken and sinful people. And in that moment, we also realize that the battle against evil is a battle against the self. That the real fight against sin is the fight that takes place against us. The real monster we have to worry about is the monster that stalks our own hearts. Now you may be wondering what in the world can werewolves have to do with the first letter of John? Now, as I mentioned before, we're looking over this over these next few weeks, John's letter. And this was a, a, a letter that was written by one of the first 12 disciples, one of the original apostles, a guy named John. He also wrote the Gospel of John and the book of Revelation. And this is one of the letters, or we call them epistles, that he wrote to us. And in this letter, what John is teaching us is how to be heroes of our own story. How we can find victory in life. And, and as every hero that has to find a victory, we've got to face enemies. And the greatest enemy we face is the enemy that dwells inside of us all. But he's telling us how to fight and to resist this sin, this monster inside all of us. This is how he starts out in verse 1. He says, my little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. So he lays out, first of all, here, here's the reason he's writing this whole letter. The whole reason he's writing to us, it is so that you may not sin. What he's encouraging you to do is to fight this battle inside. To fight this battle within yourself. This tendency for us to, to, to favor the monster. To go to sin and evil. To walk in the ways of sin and evil. He's writing to you so that you do not do these things. But instead that you walk in a way that imitates Christ Jesus. Now, this battle against sin is a battle that has become less important lately. And I'm talking about in our culture at large. It's, it's really not a stylish thing to talk about battling against sin or fighting against your own sin or, in your, or against your own demons. That's kind of an, an archaic, even passe thing to talk about. No, we, we live in a much more permissive culture these days, don't we? 
I mean, our culture told, tells us if it feels good, do it. To go, to go out there, follow your happiness, whatever that happiness is, or, or, or follow your heart. We don't ask, where is your heart leading you? But just follow it. it Maybe leading you off a cliff, but no, just go follow it. Follow your heart. And that's what we teach people. We don't teach people to resist sin or resist the monster within. We teach them to follow their desires. Some will even say it's unhealthy not to follow your desires. If you don't follow your desires, then you're going to develop this inner pathology. You're going to have these repressed desires. It's going to lead to some sort of insanity or some sort of a psychotic break if you don't go out and follow all of your desires. And that's why we write stories today where people fall in love with monsters. Because as a people, we're making peace with the monsters within. I'm sorry to say the church has gone soft on this battle as well. The church used to be the one to lead the charge against sin and evil, to encourage people to fight against the sin and evil within themselves, but we've gone soft on it, but for very different reasons. We actually use grace as an excuse to go soft on the battle against sin. Let's look at verse 1 again, the second part. It says, but if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also the sins of the whole world. Now this talks about the forgiveness of sins, right? This is Jesus Christ. It says, if we sin, which we know we're going to sin. If we sin, we have an advocate with Jesus. It says, Jesus the righteous, the only righteous one. And the Bible calls him the propitiation for our sins. Now, that's a, a big word people don't use a whole lot anymore. But to propitiate something is to satisfy the anger or to calm the anger down. And that's what Jesus did. He stood in as the propitiation for our sins because we incited the wrath and anger of God. We incited his justice by our sin. But Jesus Christ, the righteous, stands as our advocate. And this advocate, he was the propitiation. He satisfied God's anger. He satisfied God's justice so we don't have to pay the price for our sins. He paid it for us. But this is how the thinking goes then, right? This is the message of grace, the good news, which we preach every Sunday. And we preach it boldly. And we embrace it. But this is what happens. In our minds we think, okay, well... I mean, Jesus is taking care of the sin. Why do we have to worry about it? I mean, why do we have to go harping about sin and not sin and good and evil and just kind of run ourselves ragged and fill ourselves with guilt and shame? If Jesus is taking care of it, then why do we worry about it? And, and even worse is that we think to ourselves, well, you know, it also tells us we're sinners, we're broken, we're going to sin anyway. We can't really stop it. If we can't stop sinning and Jesus is going to forgive us for our sins, then, I mean, come on, let's just relax. You know, you do you, boo. Go out and just be yourself. Follow that heart. Don't worry about what you do. Don't worry about what pit you may fall or not fall into. Jesus is going to take care of it all. Just do your thing and let Jesus handle the rest. And so we become soft on sin. We've stopped talking about it. We've stopped worrying about it. And it's tempting to do that. It really is a very tempting argument except for, except for one little problem. Is that the scripture that tells us about grace, the spirit that leads us into grace, is also the one that convicts us about sin. This is what he says in verse 3. And by this we know that we have come to know him, him being Jesus, if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar. And the truth is not in him. Now this passage talks about knowing Jesus. Saying if we claim we know Jesus. Now there's two, uh, two, uh, two, two ways you can look at that word know. You can look at word know as an intellectual knowledge or know as in relational intimate knowledge. Now, if I ask you right here, hey, do y'all know LeBron James? Oh, yeah, 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 we know. Because we've all heard of LeBron James. So we, we know LeBron James. But that's not the same thing as if 
you grew up with LeBron James and you used to go to his house for dinner and he invited you to his wedding and you talk to him every single Wednesday, that's when you can legitimately say, I know LeBron James. It's not intellectual knowledge, it's relationship, relational, intimate knowledge. And when the, John is talking about knowing Jesus, he's talking about this relational, intimate knowledge. Do you have a relationship with Christ? Do you know him? Not know of him, but do you know him? Do you know him intimately? Do you know him as a Lord? Do you know him as a Savior? That's what he's saying about if you say you know him. And as Christians, our goal is to know Christ. To know him as a Lord, to know him as a Savior, to have this intimate relationship, this intimate knowledge where we can say that we truly are in him and we truly are the children of God. But what John's saying here is he's saying if you say you know him, if you are claiming to know Jesus Christ, but you're not walking in his way and you're not walking in his command, I'm afraid he's got hard words for us. And actually kind of rude. He says you're a liar. If you say you know Jesus, but you don't walk in his ways. If you say you know Jesus and you're not following commands, you are a liar. Now, this can be cause for worry here. I mean, some serious, serious concern. Because as John's saying, if I sin, if I stumble, then I don't know Jesus. I don't know him and have him as my savior. That's not what John means. What John, what it means is if you stumble in sin is you're not perfect. Welcome to the club. It means you're still learning how to walk. That's why you stumble. You're still learning how to get your feet under you. See, we have this mistaken perception about God sometimes. And we tend to look at God as if he is a government inspector, like with one of those government agencies. Have you ever had one of those come to your work, like OSHA or somebody like that? You know when the government inspector shows up, he's going to find something wrong, right? You know he is. He's not leaving until he finds something wrong. There's some agencies where they actually pay the inspector like a, um, like a commission by how many faults he finds. So you know they are going to find something wrong. And we think of God like that, that he's just like the inspector. He's just going to look and look until he finds something he can nitpick and find wrong. Or maybe you think of God like that, uh, like some self-righteous church member that you once knew a long time ago. Not from this church, of course, but from another church you were a member with before. Some self-righteous church member that took a lot of thrill into picking out the faults of other people. And we think of God like that. But God isn't like that. God doesn't need to pick out your faults. God doesn't need to nitpick and comb through your soul to look at all the ways that you've sinned and you've done stuff wrong. No, if God looks at upon you and he's drawing near to you, it's not to pick out your faults. He's looking to see if he can see Christ in you. That's what he's looking for. He's not looking for your faults. He's not looking for your mistakes. He's looking to see his son reflected in your life. He's looking to see Jesus reflected in your words, reflected in your actions, and most of all, reflected in your heart. God's not there trying to bust you or to keep you out of heaven. God wants to see you reach your potential. It's a potential you don't even fully realize yet. He wants you to be like Jesus. Friends, we can't be like Jesus if we let the beast win. We can't be like Jesus if we let sin become the rule of our life. Because if sin is the rule of our life, how can we say that Christ is the Lord of our life? If we let the monster win, how can Jesus win in us? And if you don't see your sin as a monster, then you don't realize the true nature of sin and evil. And God loves you too much to let something like that spoil his good creation. Because you're better 
much better than a broken creature. Listen to what he says in verse 5. He says, but whoever keeps his word, in him truly the love of God is perfected. By this we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. This is what God wants for you, for every single one of you. He wants to see his love perfected in you. I think that is just a beautiful way to put it. To see his love perfected in you, perfected in your life, perfected in your personality, perfected in your mind, in your soul, in who you are. And that's the reason for all these things that he does. The reason why he gave us these commands, the reason why he gave us these laws, the reason why he teaches us about sin and evil and about good and evil and about good and not good. The, the whole reason he teaches us, it was the reason his son came and incarnated among us. It was the reason he died on the cross. It was the reason for his resurrection to life. It's his reason for forgiveness. It's the reason why he gives us his grace so that his love may be perfected in you. The way that happens is that we walk in the way of Christ. We follow in the footsteps of our Lord, not of the world, not of our sinful desires, but in the ways of Christ. Imitate his life. Obey his word. Obey his every command in our life. Do we do it perfectly? No. Don't do it perfectly. That's why John reminds us at the beginning of this passage, if you sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, the propitiation for all of our sins. But friends, if we let the beast win, then we shut Christ out of our life. If we let the beast have dominion over us, we're saying, I want the monster more than I want Jesus. I had a conversation this week with uh, one of our elders, and he put it to me just right. He said, the older I get, the more I hate this sinful part of me. And what he also meant was the more mature that, that he becomes in Christ, the more he hates this sinful part that dwells within him. Friends, we all have a beast inside of us, every single one of us. We all have a potential for sin. We have a potential for evil. And the longer we walk in Christ, the more we hate that monster that lives within us. So how do we kill it? How do we get rid of it? Of course, as you all know, according to the lore, you shoot the monster with a silver bullet. Unfortunately, that kills the person too, right? We don't want to kill the person. We want to cure God doesn't want you dead. God wants you to live and live abundantly. Kind of went on a whim and decided to look up to see if there were any older cures for being a werewolf. And I came across something interesting. Way in the Middle Ages, before they had silver bullets, before they even had bullets at all, they actually had a way to cure somebody of being a werewolf. They said a way to cure a person of being a werewolf is you call them by their Christian name three times. That's what it took. Remind them who they are. Help them remember their name, and not just any name, their Christian name. Help them remember who they are. Now we know there's only one cure for sin, and that's the blood of Jesus. That blood's working in me, and it's working in you. And we know we can't cure ourselves, we can't cure sin on our own, but we can remember who we are. We can remember who we're made to be. And you are not a beast. You are not a monster. You are made in the image of God. You are not made to walk in darkness. You are made to live in light. You were not made to be consumed by sin. You were created so the love of God would be perfected in you. 
To God be all the glory forever and ever. Amen. Friends, will you pray with me? Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe. Father, we come to you today with a heart full of thanksgiving. We thank you for all that you have given us. We thank you, Lord, that while we were lost, you came and found us. That while we were in darkness, you gave us light. Or that while we were consumed by sin and ugliness, Lord, you still loved us. And out of that love, Lord, there is something holy in us now. Father, I pray that the grace that you have placed in our hearts would be a grace that multiplies. Father, we pray that grace that you have placed in our heart would be like a seed planted in good soil. And in us, it would multiply. And in us, Lord, it would spread to the whole world. Father, I pray that we remember this great gift that you have given us. Father, I pray that we remember our true name. That we are your children. And as your children, Lord, we are made for something glorious. Father, as we go through our days and weeks and years of life, may we keep this memory strong in our hearts. Lord, that you have truly made us for glory. Father, help us to remember that we are not creatures of this world, but we are creatures of heaven. Help us to remember, Lord, that we were not made for sin and evil. That we were made for the glory of everlasting life. Father, we trust in you and our grace to transform us. To transform us, Lord, and to feed that better part of our nature. That grace to transform us and lead us, Lord, that we can walk the path of your Son. That we can walk in all of his ways. And walk in all of the great love he has for us. And trusting you, Father, we pray your grace upon our world. We pray your grace upon a world that has lost you, Lord. A world that walks in deep darkness that needs your light. Father, we pray for all those who do not know the truth of your love. And that your light would shine down upon them. We pray for all those, Lord, that suffer in great pain. And that you would be their healing. Father, we pray for all those that need healing for their bodies. We pray for Joe and for Peepsy. And for Carol and for Debbie. And for Bailey and for Adam, for Isabel and for Gerald. We pray healing strength upon them in body, soul, and spirit. Lord, we pray for all those that grieve today. We lift up to you the Cortez family. We lift up to you Aaron and his family, Lord. And Father, just pray that by your spirit you could comfort them as only you can give comfort. Father, we pray for our children and for our families and for our lives. And that you would preserve us and keep us. In body, soul, and spirit. Father, we lift up to you unspoken prayers. And pray, Father, in this time that you would hear the silent cries of our hearts. We lift up all these prayers in the name of your Son, our Savior Christ Jesus, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. My friends, Christ our Savior has given us so much, including victory over sin and evil. And he has asked that this good news be preached to the whole world. And in gratitude for this and all the gifts he has given us, we are asked to give back to God. We give him our gifts, we give him our prayers, and we give him our tithes and offerings to support this work of declaring the good news and providing worship for the only one God. 
If you would like to give to the work here at Cherokee Presbyterian, there are many ways that you can give. We have offering plates on either sides of the door as you exit the sanctuary. You can also give through Venmo, PayPal, ACH Bank Draft, or United States Postal Service. And we thank you for all the ways that you support the work and the ministry here at Cherokee Presbyterian. And now in response of thanksgiving to all that God has given us, let us stand and sing together. Let us pray. Good and gracious Father, we thank you for every gift that we, you have given us. And we come to you today and give back a small portion of that abundance and ask that you would bless both the gift and the giver. And all that we bring to you today will be used for your glory and for the advancement of your kingdom and the advancement of the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ until every knee bows and every tongue confesses Jesus Christ as Lord. Amen. Now we're going to continue standing and say what it is we believe using the words of the Apostles' Creed. And you can find those words printed in your bulletin. Friends, what is it you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We are going to remain standing and sing hymn number 307, Fight the Good Fight. Friends, go now as victors over sin and evil. Fight the good fight of faith. And remember where we fail, Christ sustains. And may the mercies of the everlasting God shepherd your souls until he leads you to glory. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. <laughs> 